title of the message today, I had to explain to my son what the mad cow disease was. Uh, well, so he got a he got a little education today. Mad cow disease. I explained to him that I to this day can still not give blood because I was in Europe. You were too. I was in Europe during that time. So um, in the eighties, uh, for those of you that are a lot younger, Jesse, she's like, do you know what mad cow disease is, Jesse? Okay. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, it, the farmers realized, uh, mostly in Great Britain, but all of Europe, different places, their cattle started losing their gait and staggering and fall over, and they couldn't get them back up. And uh, <coughs> they found out uh, this parasitic infection thing was uh, turning their brains and spinal cords into spongy material, and of course that just doesn't work out. But um, they, uh, they had to put a lot of cattle down, and there was a lot, of, a lot of folks that was worried that it would actually get to humans, and then guess what? It, uh, they found out that uh, it was called, um, got to hear because I don't, uh, Kreutzfeldt Jacob disease, uh, two physicians that uh, discovered it in humans. I'd rather be named after the cure myself, but you know, yeah. anyway. <laughs> Kreutzfeldt Jacob disease, um, and there was a few, and it, and it it was impacted. I mean, it got there because they ate the meat, so lots and lots of cattle were uh, put down. Uh, and my wife reminded me that that's all I ate in the '80s, so I deserve not to be able to give blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I won't get off track, but you can ask me later how I ate three cheeseburgers and french fries a day while I was in Augsburg, Germany. Anyway, um, what does the mad cow disease got to do with today's sermon? Well, long before the 1980s, there was another set of mad cows. There were seven mad cows that obviously were out of their mind. They were lean cows, and we read about them. In uh, Genesis uh, 41, 1 through 4, uh, this will be the message because it just, because I just wanted to use the message. Two years passed, okay, real quick, two years passed. Joseph, if you all remember, the dreamer had told the butler, right, and the baker, he interpreted their dreams and three days later he was right. The, but, the butler was happy about that. The baker was not so happy about that because he died, amen. So anyway, Read it. <laughs> it's a good story. Two years passed, and Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile River. Seven cows came up out of the Nile, all shimmering with health, and grazed on the marsh grass. Good stocky. I mean, the kind you really want a good ribeye steak. <laughs> and then seven other cows, all skin and bones, came up out of the river after them and stood by them on the bank of the Nile. Scrawny, nasty looking and the skinny cows ate the seven healthy cows and it just says then pharaoh woke up you know he just like <laughs> cold sweat that kind of wake up go <laughs> time to get a cheeseburger before they're lean See, Lee's lean cows ate these fat cows, and they stayed lean. That would wake me up. Of course, you know, he had another dream about the corn and the same thing. So the seven, it meant something. And it appears at this time, I mean, Pharaoh had it made, if you think about it. Um, economically, politically, uh, militarily, they were on top of the world. In fact, they could be considered the superpower of the world at that time. Everything was going perfect. And then the mad cows show up. Amen. The mad cows show up. And there's something disturbing about reoccurring dreams. Anybody in here can relate to that? A reoccurring nightmare, a reoccurring bad dream. I mean, that gets on you. It gets under your skin, man, and that's all you can think about. And uh, dreaming two successive dreams kind of meaning the same thing, so he needs some help. And uh, the op this, this opening uh, scripture said, and two years later, 
question is because Joseph had told those guys, he, well, he told the butler. <laughs> he knew the best. But he said, hey, when it comes true, make sure you tell the Pharaoh, maybe it'll help me out, you know. But it was two years later when Pharaoh has this dream. And uh, I want you all to realize that Pharaoh's dream will be part of our lives all the time. It's never happy, live happily ever after. You know, I'm not a preacher of doom, but I'm a preacher of truth. We are not immune from this type of thing happening in our lives. There are mad cows in our lives. Some of y'all know which mad cows there are, and some of you are fixing to figure it out if you came expecting. Amen? See, with every hint of prosperity in our lives, there is a moment where we have a leveling action that adverser, adversity. <laughs> That's a nice way of saying it's not so prosperous. Amen? Um, our lives are filled with variables. Our lives are filled with changes. Our lives are filled with challenges, all of which come by the way of mad cows a lot of times. Life is not one uninterrupted live happily ever after. We will have seasons of sadness. And it's good to preach this because some people, they leave thinking, man, everything's great. I give my life to the Lord. And then when it doesn't, they get upset. But if I'm telling you right now, there's, there are seasons of sadness. Life is not one long occasion of good health. Is there anybody here that's never, ever been sick? I'm waiting. Okay. <laughs> there are seasons of sickness. Life is not one victory after victory after victory after victory. At some point, we have to deal with losses, a defeat that we don't want to talk about. Life is not always prosperity. We have setbacks that we have to endure. Life is not one accomplishment after another. There are hopes that get dashed under those mad cow's feet. <laughs> And there are cows, there are mad cows that are going to come along that want to destroy each and every one of us. And there are mad cows that talk. There are mad cows that talk. It will, be, it, it, it will not be too long in life before we notice that our mad cows are talking to us. And some of y'all are kind of already getting this. And it's like, oh yeah... Okay, good. So I'm going to go into a whole other part of the scriptures, into the Word of God. It's in Nehemiah. And we're going to talk about mad cows, and Nehemiah showed us how to handle this. And it's so simple that by the time you hear it about the third time, you'll be like, oh, man, I got it, Monty, I got it. But it's so simple, okay? Because the mad cows of your dreams will do everything they can to devour what God has already promised you or God's already given you. You may have it, and yet you give it back because the mad cows talked you into doing that. Amen. Nehemiah faced his attackers. He faced his attackers, but he kept on working. And that's what we got to do. God's got y'all doing something. Some people come to me like, I don't know what God wants me to do. He wants you to do what you've been doing for him. I don't care if it's mowing grass, cleaning a toilet, or just being a good wife or a good husband, a good child. He wants you to keep doing what you're doing. And we, we're trying to figure out this, this great thing. We need this, this awesome revelation. And he's going, just help. <laughs> Terry Nance threw that one in there anyway. Consider the foes. That Nehemiah had to contend with. The first one we're going to talk about, uh, nobody has to do with this and probably. You've never probably had a mad cow talk to you angry. Bring anger into your life. <laughs> Here we are in Nehemiah, chapter 4. The first two verses. I'm good at ignoring sometimes. When, when Sanballat San heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he exploded in anger vilifying the Jews in the company of his Samaritan cronies and military he let loose what are these miserable Jews doing do they think they can get everything back to normal overnight make building stones out of make-believe that's 
I'm pretty sure the message again because it just sounded good, so I used it. Um, it is good because because somebody, Sam Ballot, Sam Ballot, is upset because Nehemiah has a vision to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. And just so you understand, Nehemiah's not a construction guy. He's not a mason guy. He was a cupbearer for Artaxerxes. <laughs> but he loved his homeland, and he wanted it rebuilt. And he took on the mission. And God will do anything through a cupbearer that he wants to. Amen? Amen. So uh, Sambalot rants, and he raves. His anger was like Nebuchadnezzar when he, you know, he stoked up the fire seven times for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. All it accomplished was it killed two of his own men that were throwing them in because it, it was already hot enough, but he was so mad and so angry. Now, let's just, let's be honest. You know Nehemiah was shook up. Is there anybody in here that don't get upset when somebody gets upset with you? Because I need to know the secret. Okay. Uh, you get mad at me, I get mad at you. You rear up my head, man. Nehemiah, I'm sure, was upset on the inside. He was really on fire, but he was as calm. You know, uh, I love the lake when it's glad, silky smooth. Not a ripple in the lake. You ever been out there on the lake when it's ripple smooth? I could get that houseboat up to 15 mile an hour on a day like that. Amen. When you start building a wall... When you start building the church, and I'm not talking about a building, I'm talking about the body of Christ. You go out and you start, you start giving testimony, you start being a, a shining beacon for Jesus Christ. When you start building up that church, the body, when you start building up your life and start doing things you should do and quit doing things you shouldn't do, when you start going to whatever you've been having an unction to do and you know it's the right thing to do and you start doing that, you start making better choices for yourself, whether it's eating better and doing exercise, that wasn't in here, but I guess God's talking to me right now. So, and when you start turning the rubble in your life into a wall, the sand bullets and the mad cows are going to come out. And they're going to start talking to you. And they're going to they're bring it with anger. Now, instead of fighting, <laughs> even though Nehemiah was upset, this is the first of them. Many times you're going to see this. We kept at it. He didn't stop long enough to even talk smack back at him. We kept at it, repairing and rebuilding the wall. The whole wall was soon joined together and halfway to its intended height because the people had a heart for the work. Don't you know if Nehemiah would have took the time to start arguing, other people would have stopped working? He kept at it. Whatever you're doing for God, keep doing it. And if you're doing something wrong, at least you're doing it for God, right? I can't think of anything else to be doing wrong for if I'm doing it for the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Well, I made a mistake, but I was trying to do it for God. How about the mad cow of worldly wisdom? Some of us, we turn to our friends, or we don't even... We, you ever got any unsolicited advice? <laughs> How about this guy? <laughs> At his side, Tobiah the Ammonite jumped in and said, That's right. What do they think they're building? Why, if a fox climbed that wall, it'd fall to pieces under his weight. He don't know what he's doing. He's just a cupbearer. He don't, there's not a clue. If he just look at that wall, he'd realize it's going to fall down. He's talking smack and trying to talk him down. He's sowing seeds of doubt, worldly wisdom, sarcasm, trying to get him to stop again. And if you go back and look, if you're, if you're taking notes, Nehemiah 2.9, you will find out. I knew she always takes lots of notes. If y'all ever want to send notes, just see Barbara afterwards. Okay. Nehemiah 2.9, you will find out <laughs> that Tobiah was a slave. So two chapters later, <laughs> he's, he's got some power. Must have schmoozed his way up. Amen? He was the kind of guy that was always finding a way to move up. We'll leave it at that. But he ridiculed their efforts. He kept up a constant distraction, again, trying to keep Nehemiah from doing what God's got him doing. Amen? But Nehemiah handled him how? Maybe y'all hadn't. 
We kept at it, repairing and rebuilding the wall. The whole wall was soon joined together and halfway to its intended height because the people had a heart for the work. That is how you prepare for mad cows. That is how you fight mad cows. Although in the flesh we want to go ahead and bow up and talk back to them or go ahead and get involved in a conversation. Huh? Throw punch Thursday. A lot of prayer needed for my folks out here. So. <laughs> mad cows. Mad cows. How about the mad cow of divided loyalties? This one's from within, and it happens to a lot of us. Oh. Uh-oh. There we go. Then I s met secretly. Then I met secretly with Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the son of Metabel, at his house. And he said, let's meet at the house of God, inside the temple. Whew. Let's find safety behind locked doors because they're coming to kill you. Yes, coming by night to kill you. He's trying to instill fear and stop them from working all together and go lock themselves up in the little church. Hmm? Because they're out there in that ocean building a wall. <laughs> the man had been hired by Tobiah and Sanballat, which are enemies of God. And so now it's, I mean, that's where his paycheck's coming from, if you will. And he's trying to bring Nehemiah into a place of what's called inactivity, a place to hide and be safe and that means the work won't get done i know this is hitting home for some of us where we've had a friend or a brother or sister in christ that's actually sowed seed of that like fear and you know you need to just take you know we don't you really just don't want to go there and it stops you in your actions to doing what god wanted you to do amen his spiritual talk was full of doom and he corrupted the house of faith and made it a territory of fear. What's the motto of our church? Uh-oh. Uh a couple old-timers left here. <laughs> okay. Faith mobilizes, fear paralyzes. Fear stops us in our tracks. And he's sowing seeds in there. We're going to talk about fear some more. He was motivated by money. And I'll tell you what, you need to pay attention to who is talking to you and take it with discernment and pray from God who's controlling his voice or her voice that's talking to you because their paycheck may be coming from the enemy. And that is divided loyalty. Amen? Every church, every district, every organization, there is a divided sense of loyalty. A lot of people just have their own agenda. And so when they sow this seed of discernment to you, this seed of what well, God's showing me to you, you need to pray hard and make sure that their paycheck's coming from God and not your enemy. Amen? <laughs> Divided loyalties. So what do you think he did to fight this? <laughs> well, we kept at it. Amen. Kept at it. This is a great story. I'd encourage you to read the rest of it and how they kept at it because it, it, it's pretty neat. I mean, uh, it reached a point where they were ready to f defend themselves and kept building. Amen. Now we talk about fear. Fear itself. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat. According to these, their works, and on the prophetess, Noadiah, okay, the rest of the prophets that would have been have put me in fear. This woman, she used her sacred position. That's why, I t you know, I tell y'all, you don't just listen to what I say. Go back and read the word and apply the word. Make sure the word is in agreement with what I say. If not, you need to come to me first and say, hey, I don't, I'm not, either I misunderstood you, you're totally wrong. <laughs> and we, we sort that out, amen? amen. This prophetess, she's threatened, instilled doubt. 
stirred up dread and she's prophesying evil things against what he's doing which is for the Lord building a wall just because it may appear spiritual is not necessarily a reason for you to want to embrace that person or create an alliance with that person we have to pray for discernment because I tell you fear is always fear itself is always motivated by imperfect love Fear will devour the most useful stock and fruit that you have. No matter how good you were going, fear will stop you from continuing. Don't give in to your fear. Did Nehemiah? Well, let's see. What did Nehemiah do? <laughs> have you all got this now? So what do you all need to do? Keep at it. <laughs> Whatever you're done. Amen. <laughs> you just keep on going. Don't let mad cows get the best of you. Worship the Lord and do his will. I, I, some, a lot of folks just don't realize they're, that what they're doing is his will. Amen. I, um, just being a good person. Just make, putting a smile on somebody's face. Just showing the love. Just taking a few, a few minutes of time to do something. Is, it, that may be all God's wanting you to do today. There's a lot of discouragements that come from these mad cows. A lot of people have Pharaoh's dream. And it'll come to pass for us. But, you know, it's not the, fa the feast and famine. These, these, these are going to hit close to home. Lean cows of laziness will eat up our times of great work. Well, now Monty's meddling. <laughs> Lean cows of spiritual coldness. Spiritual coldness will freeze out the times of revival and fervent prayer. We've all dealt with this. I've dealt with this. Lean cows of worldliness will throw us back a few steps that we've advanced in our spiritual life. We'll get caught up in something of the world, and next thing you know, we're forced. To, we then took three steps towards doing something better, and now we find ourselves back here four steps. We've, we've went backwards because of something we got involved, some worldly thing that we got involved in. Don't miss this. Spiritual coldness. We've got to be, be aware of the lean cows in our lives. Amen? Lean praises, lean prayers, lean devotions, lean experiences. Because they can have their ways with us. The lean cows can have their ways with us if we neglect prayer. If we neglect, neglect prayer for a short time, we lose our hunger to pray. Y'all know I'm telling you the truth. You just miss a few days, and you're like, man, now, you know, a week and a half later, you're like, man, I didn't. Or maybe if you go to church on Sunday, you finally on Sunday go realize, man, I hadn't prayed all week. You lost your hunger to pray, but if you do it every day, you have the hunger that's there, if that makes sense. If we, ne oh, this one's powerful. If we neglect our love and our hunger for the word of God, we will lose the power that comes from that. See, the living word of God, when we're reading it, it's filling us up spiritually filling us up there is a power there there is a comfort there there's all you can you get anything you need when you open up the bible and you start reading expecting amen so what's the answer for all this well bring on the dreamer bring on the dreamer 11 years had passed okay since joseph had been sold into slavery by his brothers he'd been forced to endure betrayal by his brothers he was on trumped up charges from potiphar's wife he's figuring he's going to spend the rest of his life in a prison and we're not talking about like what we have for prisons okay and he's left to rot and he's just assuming that's the way it's going to be and two years prior to this he had been called on to interpret the the prayers that i told you about the butler and and, and the baker now he had no idea that pharaoh is being troubled by a dream but he's getting ready to be used again amen now, here's an application you ain't going to like. Sometimes you have to interpret and bless the dreams of others before your own will ever come to pass. Well, I didn't want to hear that. Sometimes we have to interpret and bless other people's dreams before our dreams come to pass. Think about it. He's, they're looking like nearly 13 years. And none of his dreams. I mean, he dreamed about his father, mother, and his 
brothers bowing down to him. Remember, that's what started the whole thing and them not wanting nothing to do with him. It's fixing to happen though, isn't it? If y'all remember the story of Joseph. Here's the next part you're not gonna like. You gotta have patience. You gotta let patience work in you. It's like, I know, you're, you're looking at me like I'm the doctor that told you you need to lose weight and exercise. You're going, I don't wanna hear about it. Well, the Word of God says, oh, bring on the dreamer. The Word of God says, James 1, 3 and 4, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect, perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, that's, that's a lot easier to say than do. It's a lot easier. I mean, let's just be honest, all of us. We have to admit, Amen. Patience is not something. I tell people, don't pray for patience. <laughs> yes. Patience and I want it now, they don't work. But a lot of us have said, when is the healing going to come? Maybe for myself. When is the healing going to come for somebody I've been praying for? When is revival coming? When is my children going to get saved? When is my spouse going to have a spiritual awakening? So many pray for that. You have one, one individual in here in the church and the other's not here. Or any church, not just mine, ours. Amen. Amen. When, is, when is my thorn finally going to be banished from my flesh? When am I going to ever get beyond this setback that I'm living? When am I going to get over the pain of this difficult trial that I'm going through? When will I experience the revival that I've longed for within me? And when will I, when will I, when, when, when? Patience. I'm going to wrap this up with a little illustration. It's by Joe Bailey. He wrote a book entitled The Last Thing We Talk About. And this is a very good story. It's a painful book and one that cost a great price because of what he had gone through. He, death of all three of his sons. And, you know, that's just not the normal, you know, the kids are supposed to say goodbye to their parents, you know. Um, Danny, John, and Joe all died of different ages at different things. The youngest being uh, at five with leukemia. And remember those heartaches? Joe Bailey wrote about the day that his hope finally come back. Listen to this. This is what he wrote. He said, one Saturday morning in January, I saw the mail truck stop at our mailbox up on the road. Without thinking, except that I wanted to get the mail, I ran out, to the ran out of the house, run up the road in my short sleeves. It was bitterly cold. The temperature was below zero. There was a brisk wind from the north, and the ground was covered with more than a foot of snow. I opened the mailbox, pulled out the mail, and was about to make a mad dash for the house when I saw what was on the bottom. And under the letters, a burpee seed catalog. On the front were bright zinnias. I turned it over, and on the back were huge tomatoes. For a few moments, I was oblivious of the cold. I leafed through the catalog, tasting corn and cucumbers, smelling roses. I saw the fl uh, freshly plowed earth. I smelled it. I let it run through my fingers. And, f and for those brief moments, I was living in the springtime and the summer. Winter had passed. Then the cold penetrated to my bones, and I ran back to the house. <laughs> and when the door closed behind me and I was getting warm again, I thought how my moment at the mailbox were just like the experiences in our life. We feel the cold along with those who do not share our hope. The biting wind penetrates us as them. But in our cold times, we have a seed catalog. We open it, and we smell the promised spring, eternal spring. And the first fruit that settles our hope is Jesus Christ, who was raised from death and cold earth to glory eternal. Isn't that awesome? So the conclusion of that is it won't be winter forever. We all go through it. Some of us a lot longer than we want to. But if you're contending with mad cows right now, and I shouldn't say if, I'm, and, well, if you're not, when? 
because we don't live happily ever after, remember that winter does not last forever. And also, you need to remember that somewhere in your past, there's victories that you forgot about. Somewhere in your past, you did prepare for the mad cows. Now, I'll be honest, and you're probably just like me, we didn't prepare as good as we should have. Okay? But we did prepare. And there are some past victories that you need to be able to remember and draw on. Y'all remember King David, anointed to be the next king. And if you remember, I think the pivotal moment for Saul was when they said, Saul's killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. You know, this is a man, this is a warrior. But he had forgotten some of his past victories. The final uh, scripture. And David said unto Ahimelech, he's on, he's on the run. And is there not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither bought, brought my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste. He was running scared. Now this is the one that's killed tens of thousands. Y'all getting this? Look at what happens. And the priest said, the sword of Goliath, oh yeah, the giant that he killed, right? The priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take it, take it, for there is none other save that here. And David said, there is none like that, give it me. Each and every one of y'all have, you have killed Goliaths in your life. And you, sometimes we just let the mad cow do that talking in our ear and we start giving up. We don't realize you are a David. There's no one in here that doesn't have some victories. Then you need to remember that. Somewhere in your past, there's a sword that you once had a victory with. Amen? There's some ears of corn that you've stored up and long since forgotten. There's some prayer meetings that you were in and it had a moving onto your spirit. There was prayers you've had somewhere and the Spirit of God... <laughs> Manifested on and in you. Amen? So remember those victories. There are songs that you sing or did sing that are now anthems for your battle cry. That's my words of encouragement to you. Just keep on keeping on. And remember that you've got victories in your past. Rely on them. Believe it. God can do anything for you. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, thank you for a powerful message about the mad cows. That mad cow disease that infiltrates each and every believer, those talking cows, Lord. And I just I pray right now, you've showed each and every one of us those that we need to put at bay. As we rely on you, we ask you to remind us of those victories and of those prayers and those movements of the Holy Spirit that was within us. Let us stand on that. Stand on your promises ready to battle, but not to get distracted and have us keep on keeping on and doing what we're supposed to be doing for you. God is daily, every day. We ask all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.